Well, let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, shall we? Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we are, of course, still dealing with the Sermon of the King, chapters 5, 6, and 7, also called the Sermon on the Mount. Now, in chapter 5, we looked at what we are. We are perfect, we are righteous, which speaks of our position in Christ. Then in chapter 6, we turned a little corner where we began to look at what we do. And the idea is when we fully understand what we are in, through, and because of Christ, it will affect what we do in our lives. And so far, we looked at six different areas of our lives that should be affected in light of what we are. We looked at giving, we looked at praying, fasting, forgiving, storing, and serving. Now, this brings us to the seventh thing we want to look at in light of what we do, and it involves worrying. So let's pick up our reading in verse 25, and we'll read down through verse 34, the end of the chapter. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? <laughs> Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed as like one of these. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, just a cursory reading of our text today indicates that the seventh thing we'll be looking at in light of what we do involves worrying. But notice in verse 25 how this entire section begins with the word therefore. The word therefore means because of or for this cause. Now this ties it together to the previous section where Jesus was, was dealing with material possessions. When he said, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then in verse 24, he said, we cannot serve two masters for we will love the one and hate the other, serve the one and despise the other. We cannot serve God and mammon. In other words, all of the riches, all of the treasures of this world that we hold so dear in our life, all of our material, material possessions are either going to be destroyed, stolen, or burned. Therefore, verse 25, do not worry. That's the context. Now, for you note-takers, you outliners, uh, we're going to be looking at two things about worrying in our study today. Two things. Number one, first of all, we're going to look at the command to stop worrying. That's in verses 25 and 26, a command to stop worrying. Uh, let's just read it again. In the beginning of verse 25, therefore I say to you, do not worry. Now, this is an imperative in the Greek grammar. We are commanded to stop worrying. In fact, the grammar indicates that worrying is an action that you and I are already doing, and we need to stop it. We need to knock it off. 
Jesus is saying, I know you're already worrying about some things, so knock it off. In fact, drop down to verse 31. Look at verse 31. Therefore, do not worry. Uh, look at verse 34. Verse 34. Therefore, do not worry. In fact, the word worry or worries is used six times in these ten verses. Clearly, this is an important topic for all of us. In fact, it's, it's very important in light of the current world situations today because you know as well as I do, we are circling the drain. Um, look, things... <laughs> Man, I, I look at, I look at uh, society. When we look at societal norms, man, anything goes. Everything is either uh, uh, right or wrong, but it's all upside down. What is right is now wrong, and what's wrong is now right. Society is turned upside down on its head. Anything goes. There are no absolutes. Everything is relative to what, what anybody thinks or believes. Hey, we look at the... Uh, political climate today. Boy, talk about crazies. Uh, I mean, people are heading off the deep end. I mean, don't they know history? You know, those who don't know history are doomed and bound to repeat it. Uh, and I can't believe so many people are so stupid today. <laughs> and talk about the spiritual climate. Boy, people are off the deep end. You know, you can believe in just about whatever you want to today and talk about the 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 abundance of religious weirdos. Well, I go to the church of the glowing mushroom. Like, what? Are you kidding me? Hey, listen, the whole world is upside down today. You say, you know, Clark, I wasn't worried about anything till I came here. Um, <laughs> but now I am genuinely worried. Now, <laughs> There are two things that Jesus commands us to stop worrying about in verse 25. Note them carefully. Number one, the first thing involves our life. Our life. Look at verse 25 again. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. So the first thing we're commanded to stop worrying about, something we already are, is our life. Kind of interesting, the word life is the word suke. We could almost say it in English. It's our English word psyche. We get our English word psychology. It speaks of the mind, our emotions, or our soul, we would say. So don't worry about your emotions, your mind, your soul. Don't worry about that. It's simple, it's straightforward. However, what I thought was very intriguing is that in verse 25, Jesus likes, likens or links our, our soul, our emotions to food and drink. Don't worry about your life, your inner man, as it pertains to food or drink. It doesn't seem like those two go together. However, when we back up a few verses we see now the point that Jesus is driving home. And that is the food of this world could never satisfy the hunger of the soul. The beverages of this world can never quench the thirst of the inner man. In speaking of the possessions of the world in the previous verses... All of the things, because here's the problem a lot of us face. Well, you know, not us, but people at other churches. We think if we have more stuff, we're going to feel more peace, more rest. Then we'll be satisfied. Then there's going to be this, oh, I've arrived kind of an idea. But the problem is we never have enough. We always want a little bit more. Why? Because the things of this world can never satisfy our life, our emotion, our soul, the inner man. Only Jesus Christ could quench that thirst. Only Jesus Christ can satisfy that hunger that's within us in the inner man. So the first commandment to stop worrying involves our life. Number two, the second commandment is to, involves our bodies. Our bodies. Look at verse 25 again. In the middle of the verse it says, nor about your body what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now, Jesus switches from our life, the internal, to our bodies, 
the external. And it speaks of putting things on the outside. And we can probably agree that a great deal of importance is placed on the outward man in today's culture and society. We're looking at things externally. We look at our bodies and we pamper it and we paint it and we put fancy clothes on it and string silver and gold around it. And, and please don't misunderstand, there's nothing wrong with that. We're certainly not coming against that. In fact, I like what J. Vernon McGee, that old-time preacher, used to say. Uh, he said, if the barn needs painting, paint it. Uh, the p- <laughs> the p- <laughs> but, the- <laughs> but the point is very simple. You and I don't need to worry about our life or our bodies, which we'll talk a little more about our bodies in just a moment. Why? Why don't we have to worry about our life or our body? The answer is because we are valuable. We're valuable. Take a look at verse 26. In verse 26, Jesus said, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Look, you don't see birds out in the field plowing the dirt, planting seeds, driving tractors, harvesting the crops. No, they don't work at all. They just pull right up and start eating. Follow me? God feeds them. Your heavenly Father feeds them. And here it is at the end of verse 26. The rhetorical question is asked, Are you not of more value than they? Well, the answer is yes. Are we more valuable than birds? Yes, of course. It, we just read that. Um, <laughs> yes, of course. We are more valuable than birds in God's estimation. Why? Well, because according to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible says we are created in God's image. Birds aren't created in God's image. The animal kingdom is not created in God's image. We are created in God's image. In fact, in John chapter 14, verse 2, Jesus said, I am preparing a place for you in heaven, not for animals. Clark, are you saying animals don't go to heaven? Yes. <laughs> And I know I'll get some hate mail from that, but read Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I think verse 21, the spirit of man goes up, the spirit of the animal goes to the dust. Okay, animals don't have souls, so they can't comprehend the gospel message and Jesus Christ. I love animals. You say, but wait a minute, in Revelation 19, Jesus and all of us are coming back on white horses. So clearly there's horses in heaven. Amen, Kathy? Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I sure hope not. I had to clean up... I had to clean up after my neighbor's horses once, and it was not fun. <laughs> and I couldn't imagine in heaven. Okay, but the point is, the point is for you and I, we are infinitely more valuable than the rest of God's creation. So this begs the question, then why do we worry about our life and our bodies? Why do we do that? Well, turn over to Philippians chapter 4, if you would, please. Philippians chapter 4. I think one reason why we worry about our life and our bodies is because we lack contentment. We're not content with who we are, the body, or what we have, our life. We're not content with what God has given us. In fact, drop down to verse 6 of Philippians chapter 4, if you would, please. Philippians chapter 4, look at verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. In other words, don't worry about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. The idea is if we're praying about everything, we won't worry about anything. I guess we should probably ask ourselves the question, how much time do we spend praying versus worrying? Because chances are most of us spend a lot more time worrying than praying. Hello? Okay, just me, fine. <laughs> 
you can pray for me. So as we're praying about everything, it seems like we're not going to be worrying about anything. In fact, drop down to verse 10. Look at verse 10 of of, uh, Philippians chapter 4. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you uh, surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, Paul is saying, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now, y'all in the state of California, you just need to get over it, okay? I think, man, if I can just get out of California, mm, man, that would be nice. Now, here's the problem with moving. We take ourselves with us. Uh, (laughs) The place we live isn't really the problem because true contentment is not found in a place. It's found in a person, the person of Jesus Christ. He goes on, look at verse 12. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Wow. So apparently being content involves a learning process. We learn to be content in whatever state we're in, whether we've got it all or whether we have nothing at all. Why? Well, because we understand that God's going to give us everything we need. That's why, drop down to verse 19. Look at verse 19 of Philippians 4. My God shall supply most of your need according to his, oh no, excuse me, he didn't say that. He said, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Question. Will God give us everything we need? Oh, yes, absolutely, no question. Will he give us everything we want? Probably not. (laughs) But he will give us everything we need. You say, well, okay, Clark, I'll bite. How do I know what I need? Well, it's simple. You'll have it. I have no idea what I need until I have it. And then once I have it, I think, ooh, I must need this. Because God gave it to me. God provided. Now, if I don't have it, obviously I don't need it. God has made life very simple. I didn't say easy. I said simple. It's very simple. Therefore, do not worry about your life or your body. Don't worry about anything. Why? Because we're valuable to God. And he's going to give us everything that we need the moment we need it not before. Capish? Back to Matthew chapter 6. Let's come to the second and final thing we want to look at involving worrying. Number one, we looked at the command to stop worrying. Number two, let's take a look at the questions about worrying. That's in verses 27 through 34. The questions about worrying. There are two of them. The first question involves our stature. Our stature, look at verse 27. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Now, a cubit is about 18 inches. The word stature can mean a couple of different things. Kind of like we've got words that mean different things, uh, even though it's the same word, like the word sharp. It can mean the edge of a knife. It can mean how you dress. It could be speaking of your mind. So we, we apply the word sharp to a lot of different things. So too the word stature. Number one, it can refer to our height, our physical height. Question, why do we not worry about getting taller? Well, because we can't do anything about that. Oh, we might be able to buy some silly shoes, puff up our hair, I don't know, maybe... Um, <laughs> You know, I'll never forget the first time I met Sally. She was going to a a beauty show up in L.A. Her friend was a model, and Sally did the hair and the makeup. She was an esthetician. So they were going up to L.A. to, like, this Hollywood thing. Anyway, whatever it was, I looked at her, and I thought, whoa. She had high heels on, like six-inch heels. Her hair, this big hair, went straight up. I mean, this was 1979, okay? It went straight up, and she looked like she was six feet tall. And I'm thinking, whoa, 
wow. I was 6'5", so I'm thinking, perfect. <laughs> so we got together, true story, we got together on our first date. We went to a friend's house to the swimming pool. There was a barbecue, and everybody was, I was swimming, everybody was swimming, and here was Sally sitting on the edge of the pool. I'm thinking, well, why isn't she swimming? What's wrong? I mean, you know, I'm thinking, come on, come on in, have some fun. She goes, no, I'm okay here. Well, I get up and I throw her in the water. Not the smartest thing I've ever done. And this giant hair, was, whoosh, she was only five foot four. So, <laughs> so we don't worry about getting taller. Why? Because we can't do anything about it. So why worry about things we can't do anything about is the point. But there's a second way we can look at this, this idea of stature. It can be talking about our life, our life. Speaking of the length of our life, adding a cubit to your stature or adding one day to your life. Look, none of us can add one day to our lives. Now, as we talked about earlier, we, we don't worry about our body, though we should take care of it. And I think there's a balance in that. Um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we should take care of the temple. Uh, we should not uh, abuse that temple, our physical bodies. We should take good care. In fact, Paul said uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, that bodily exercise profits a little. I mean, that's why I, I only exercise a little, but um, the point is, the point is we should take care of our bodies. But look, we're all going to die on time. We're all going to die on time. And every funeral, every memorial I've ever gone to, it seems like somebody's saying, oh, you know, they passed too soon. Their life was too short. And, and I get that from a personal standpoint, from a, a practical standpoint, but... The truth of the matter is when our work on earth is done, God's going to call us home. And there's nothing we can do to extend that no matter how well we eat or how much we exercise. We're all going to die on time. In fact, those who are worried about dying are usually the ones who go first because they're, they worry themselves right into the grave. So don't worry about your life. Let's come to the second question. The first question involved our stature. The second question involves our clothing, our clothing. Look at verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Now, obviously, I don't. <laughs> Sally is on me all the time. Clark, why don't you dress a little nicer? I mean, you are the pastor. You wear these ratty old Levi's with holes in them. She goes, you wear those old tennis shoes. There's cardboard in the bottom. Why don't, you, why don't you dress up a little? I said, well, you know, honey, I'm just doing what Jesus says. He says, don't worry about your clothing. And I think we should listen to Jesus. <laughs> just saying. You know, I'll never forget. I went to speak, I, I went to speak at a church up in Los Angeles in... Uh, I, I get to the church early because L.A. is quite a, quite a hike, right? So I wanted to make sure I got there on time because I was going to be speaking that night. And I get to the church a little early. The ushers are there. They're starting to unlock everything and open things up. And the musicians were getting there tuning up, you know, about an hour before service. And, and they're starting to gear up and this, that. And so I get there early. I show up and I wander in. And, uh, and it was a long drive from Temecula. So I go straight to the bathroom. And after I'm washing my hands and, and I, I take the towel and I'm wiping up the sink a little bit. And there was some water. And then I got a clean towel for the mirror. And the, a couple more sinks were kind of splashed up. So I'm cleaning them. And I got plenty of time, right? So I'm, I get some tape, paper towels, and I'm cleaning them. And then I, there was some trash on the floor. I picked it up, and I'm shoving it in the trash can. And about that time, an usher walked in. And he said, hey, don't forget to empty the rest of the trash cans. <laughs> okay. So, so, <laughs> so I bag up the trash in the, in the bathroom, put a new liner in, and I got the card, and I'm emptying the rest of the trash. By the time I finished the janitorial duty, service was about ready to start. And so I walk into the sanctuary, and I come right up to the front, and I'm going to sit in the front seat because I'm going to come up and speak, right? So I sit down right in that front seat. About that time, another rusher comes to me, and he goes, you can't sit there. I said, okay. So I move down like four seats. He goes, nope, further. Okay. So I move all the way down to the end of the aisle. 
And uh, the music starts. They sing a couple songs, and they're getting ready for the message. One of the assistant pastors came out, and he starts introducing me. Well, to Pastor Clark from Calvary Bible Fellowship. And he's, I didn't know I was so wonderful, by the way. Um, <laughs> I, I thought he was talking about somebody else. And about that time, so I stand up, and I walk up on the stage behind the pulpit, and I see the two guys that were ordering me around. It was so funny. Their jaw dropped. I, I got the biggest kick out of that. <laughs> I guess I should dress a little nicer is the point. So, <laughs> maybe a little more pastoral. No, I won't. Don't worry. Now, Jesus further drives this point home with an illustration about flowers. Look at verse 28 again. In the middle of the verse, he said, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. You don't see flowers sitting around with sewing and making beautiful garments. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today and uh, today is and tomorrow thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you? So the illustration involves flowers and Solomon. Now Solomon King Solomon, the son of King David, the third king of Israel. He was the richest, smartest, most powerful king in the kingdom. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 10, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 9. Talk about the majesty and the splendor and the glory of the Solomonic temple and, and era. Man, his clothing and everything was decked out. It was first class. But it was nothing compared to these flowers that God created. You know, every year when we go to Israel, we usually go uh, February, March in the spring, and the grass is green and tall, the flowers are blooming, and when we go up to the Mount of Beatitudes there on the northern shore of the Sea, sea of Galilee, you guys have been there, the flowers are blooming, and throughout Israel, uh, Mount Carmel down in the plain of Sharon, they have these red flowers called anemones. Um, we liken them to little red poppies. They're very velvety, smooth, beautiful flowers, and, and, and all the tourists are, are just enamored with them because they're so beautiful. And Solomon pales in comparison to these flowers. Now, According to the end of verse 30, we're given one more reason why we shouldn't worry. We already said one reason was a lack of contentment, but a second reason is a lack of faith. Look at the end of verse 30. It says, O oh, you of little faith. Why do we worry about our life? Why do we worry about our bodies? Well, one's a lack of contentment, but second, it's a lack of faith. We have little faith. Now, this becomes pretty significant. Because chances are we believe God's word is the infallible breath of God. It is inerrant. It is, if God said it, man, we stand firmly upon it. I think of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. All of God's promises in Christ are yes and amen. Ephesians 1, 3, we're blessed with every spiritual best blessing. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 3, uh, by his divine power, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness in this present age. Man, we've got it all. We are blessed because of God's word. And we have absolute faith in God and his word for our eternal life, do we not? I mean, if we were to die today, I have absolute faith that I'm going to go to heaven. I have no worry whatsoever about my eternal life. So why not have the same faith in the same God for temporal life, for everyday life, for every circumstance in my life? Same God, same faith. And I think for you and I, this becomes an important issue because the question often arises, why? Why do I lack faith for temporal life when I have such great faith for eternal life? Why is that? Well, I think there's probably a couple of reasons why. One reason is because we get our eyes off of Jesus Christ and on to our circumstances. 
because we're physical people. We look with our eyes and we see a situation, we see a problem, we see a, 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 a circumstance in our life and we begin to fixate on it and focus on it. Then we become worried about it. We get our eyes off of Jesus and on to our problem. You know, when we get to Matthew chapter 14, Lord willing, we're going to see that Peter had that same problem. When Peter was walking on water in Matthew 14, the Bible says in verse 30, he saw the wind and the waves and began to sink. Got his eyes off of Jesus, onto the storm in his life, and he began to go under. Boy, does anybody understand what we're talking about? We got to keep our eyes on Jesus. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, we're to be looking unto Jesus because he's the author and perfecter of our faith. When we get our eyes off of the Lord and onto our circumstance, God help us all. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, he said, do not look at the things that are seen, but rather look at the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Man, it's keeping that eternal perspective. So I think one problem regarding a lack of faith in our Lord for everyday life involves we get our eyes off of the Lord. But I think there's a second problem. We get our eyes off of the Word. Off of the Word, oh yes. The Word of God and faith are linked together. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. You all know the verse. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the... Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's getting our eyes off of the Word. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. We all have faith. The question is, where are we going to put it? Because it's not about a little faith or great faith. It's about the object of our faith. And we'll talk more about that in subsequent studies. Back to Matthew chapter 6. Well, this whole idea of faith is illustrated in two ways. First of all, as it pertains to things. As it pertains to things. Look at verses 31 through 33. In verse 31, it says, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Now, when he's talking about Gentiles, he's talking about non believers, those who don't believe in God, those who don't put their faith and trust in God. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So don't be like the non believers who don't have faith in God to provide all of your need according to his riches and glory, Philippians 4 19. But we're to live like believers who have faith and trust that God's going to give us all that we need. And as we've already mentioned, He's going to give us what we need, not necessarily what we want. But the whole point is in verse 33, and it points to and speaks of priorities. Priorities. But seek first the kingdom of God. I guess the question for us, what are we putting first in our life? Because whatever we put first in our life, that's our God. That's what we worship. Is it money, power, position, prestige, or is it Jesus Christ? When we put Jesus Christ first and foremost in our lives, when we prioritize him as number one, everything else simply falls into place. God's going to take care of everything else. Now, again, there's a balance in this. Because God's given us a brain, there's no doubt about that. And I think we need to use it. We should put our best foot forward. We should do everything we can do in the circumstances that are placed before us. We're not ostriches, we don't bury our head in the sand. Not that they do, but you know, that's the idea. So for us, it's about putting Jesus Christ first and foremost in our life. You know, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, the Bible says that God is working all things according to the counsel of his will. Whether I like it, understand it, agree with it or not, God's going to work it all out according to his plan and his purpose. So the first thing he illustrates in light of faith involves things. Number two, 
The second thing involves the future. The future. Look at verse 34. I like this. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow or the future. Why? For, or we would say that preposition is causative, because tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Concerns enough are for the day. I like how the old King James puts it. And there's a, there's a, there, there's a great picture that's being painted here between worry and concern. Because worry immobilizes us. Worry binds us. Worry causes all kinds of physical ailments within us. <laughs> worry causes us to crawl up in the fetal position, lie on the floor and cry like a baby. Follow me? But gen genuine concern motivates me to action. Am I concerned about this situation? Yes. How do I know? Because I'm doing something about it. Hey, look, we need to do everything we can do. We need to make all the phone calls we need to make. We need to get the jobs we need to get. We need to go to the places we need to go to, to fix this problem, to deal with this situation. We need to do everything we can do. But once we've done everything we can do, now it's out of our hands. We don't have to worry about it because we've exercised genuine concern which moves us or motivates us to action. So now we take that step back and say, okay, God, I, the ball's in your court now. I've done everything I can do. Now it's up to you. So I'm just going to put my faith in you. I'm going to keep my eyes fixed on you. I'm going to turn my heart toward your word, knowing that you're going to work it all out according to your perfect will. So the command, very simple. Stop worrying about everything. Just knock it off. Everyone okay? You say, Clark, I've tried. It's so hard. No, it's not. It's not hard. It's not tough. It's not difficult. It's impossible in and of myself because my natural tendency is to worry about everything. So what do I do? Oh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> we turn to God. Say, God, I need help. <laughs> and God says, I know. <laughs> but now you know. God, I can't do it without you. And then God says, it's okay, my child. Let me give you my Holy Spirit to empower you, to enable you, to simply trust in me. So for us, we have been told what to do, and the Bible certainly tells us what to do, but just as important, we're told how to do it. Zechariah 4, 6 says, it's not by my might nor by my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Father, we are so grateful for these few minutes together, for this incredible portion of Scripture that is so practical for all of us today, and for your Holy Spirit that enables us and empowers us to be able to stop worrying about these things. And the brain you've given us to step out and do all that we can do regarding these things, but then recognizing that, well, there's nothing else we can do about it, so, Lord, we're not going to worry about it. We're putting our faith in you, knowing that you'll orchestrate it all according to your perfect will. And Lord, truly, that is our heart, our desire that your will be done. Lord, we pray about our circumstances. We lift them up to you in prayer, dealing with our families, our relationships, our kids, our finances, our health. Whatever we're going through, the situations at work, with coworkers, employees, or employers, whatever the case may be, Lord, we want to put our best foot forward. We want to 
be wise as serpents and use the brain you've given us. But Lord, at the same time, <laughs> we recognize that uh, there are a lot of things we have no control over. So Lord, we just put those in your hands and we pray your will be done in everything all the time. And we ask it in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.